All right, so we, this um, will segue into the next segment, uh, which is um, the tribute uh, to Dr. Badaa Melafia, who, uh, for the last time on this station, for this segment, will have uh, the opportunity to listen to uh, one more time. And um, we once again commiserate with the family, and uh, we say we've suffered a huge loss, and uh, we hope that we can take the lessons from uh, the time he was with us uh, on this show uh, to be able to imbibe a lot of those lessons. And like he says, David, uh, great nation, uh, good people. people. The connection between the ministries in making agriculture work. Have you seen it happen and why hasn't it happened? A country where the budget for the National Assembly is bigger than the budget for agriculture, that country is doomed. I have to study agriculture more than even the agricultural scientists. And I have done that even to the science of agronomy to understand what the issues are. And uh, of course, if God doesn't place us in leadership, he could give us opportunity to advise. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing that synergy uh, with other sector. Transport is very important. I think uh, the Honorable Minister of Transport uh, was wrong to say everything concerned me with cattle. Everything concerned you, sir, with cattle. Uh, because uh, when you, you, know, you invest well in transportation, it has positive ramifications on other sectors, particularly agriculture, where people need to be able to transport their products, transport their crops, transport their livestock, and the rest of it. But we are not seeing that in synergy. If I had my way, there are only three things we must place on the table as national agendas of the highest order. Of course, under the umbrella of peace, and security, food security, infrastructures, including power and human capital. Those three things should have the highest. I mean, we're spending almost like a trillion, you know, a year on, on defense security related issues. And you and I know that most of these monies are never accounted for. What a disaster for a country. They cannot, they said, no, 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 we'll just give them and they decide where to buy. And then today you hear somebody from Niger, an unknown quantity from Niger took about $700 million and ran away with it. Money meant to buy military equipment. Somebody from Niger, no wonder people are saying that Nigeria is already a failed state. I never believed it, but uh, this is being said by Robert Rothbard, a very distinguished political scientist in the United States, former Harvard faculty member, and, uh, and uh, John Campbell. Both of them have written that Nigeria is virtually a, is now a failed state, officially. And of course, there was an uproar, but everything shows us that you see governance and leadership in the 21st century, as indeed of all times, require people of the highest intellect and ability. It is not a job for, for uh, idiots. When you hand over government to ignorant people, the price you pay is suffering and ignominy. Leadership in the 21st century requires skills of the highest order. People who understand world economics, who understand science, who understand technology, and above all, who have the heart of lions, who can fix things, fix the issues that matter. And if somebody is standing on your way, you kick him out. If there are vested interests that are trying to stop the development of the country, you kick them out. You deal with them. I'm looking at the environment, the entire environment. How do you think 
uh, Baba can survive. Uh, there are many issues around uh, police in Nigeria today. Do you think the environment can support uh, Baba's um, policing visions? Well, I think a uh, very important question. Uh, it is said that every police deserve, every country deserves the kind of police they get. That the police are not isolated from society. They are not living in monasteries in the real world with other Nigerians. They are, in fact, Nigerians. Uh, so, in a sense, you know, the environment, you know, particularly the political environment, is going to be a very important factor. That is why I would respectfully take a different view from my colleague. I think some element of the mandate of the police should be in our constitution. The fact that, uh, you know, uh, I'll give you an example, and this is well-known fact, that you, if, you, if you are attacked by uh, militia headsmen, you cannot report to the police. There have been cases where people have been reported and the police say, ah, that one don't pass our power, please don't go there. There's nothing we can do about it. Or they are arrested and the next day they are set free based on orders from Abuja or somewhere. And some of these shadowy figures have power to dictate to the police. There are issues where the senior echelons of the police want to make a decision, but political power say no. In advanced democracies, you cannot try that. You know that in Britain, a police constable with no rank, once arrested a minister, a serving minister of Her Majesty's government, in the United Kingdom. He was in a seedy part of town doing certain things with uh, uh, loose women. And a police constable arrested him. And of course, he was dismissed. There is no chance that, in fact, if the Prime Minister of Great Britain had made the mistake of warning that constable to drop the case, the whole government would have gone down. A constable with no rank has a constitutional mandate in the United Kingdom. And no powers can take away that mandate from that constable. What more of, a, uh, of an IG? What more of uh, the London Metropolitan Commissioner or what have you? So we need to empower the police in that sense. But of course, with power comes responsibility. Uh, and uh, responsibility comes from training, from discipline, from virtue, from integrity. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get that with the police. Yes, they say things like the police is your best friend, but it's only when you get in trouble with them that you know that if your brother in the police force can, may not be your friend at all. It is very clear that this over of a centralized bureaucratic monstrosity is not working and is programmed not to work. So we need a decentralized police system that allows uh, you know, the states or the regions uh, to control their own uh, you know, law and order issues. That is critical. You've been part of the process to as a presidential candidate and um, I'm sure you uh, can compare and contrast in terms of the quality of the electoral process uh, using electro, uh, using electro uh, technology or the electronic means uh, throughout the entire process. What, what would you say this does um, if it sails through or doesn't sail through in terms of um, uh, the impute um, between, uh, <laughs> I dare to say, uh, the manual process, many of the lawmakers talk about saying that they could be disenfranchised, to quote um, Ahmed Wase compared to what they did with the electronic um, system in 2019 and going forward, Dr. Milafia? Well, I think the electronic method is the wave of the future. Most of the civilized democracies of the world use electronic uh, voting. You know, people use the manual one as well, but, you know, in the United States, actually you can vote through your postal services. You know, you, you, you vote and you send it in. You know, electronic transmission is very common. It is the norm. And in fact, what I would have wanted to see is a more comprehensive legislation. 
look at it. We already have sufficient database. The NIS, that is the National Registration Exercise. We have a lot of database of Nigerians from that. BVN, we have a lot of registered Nigerians on that. NCC, the telcos were punished because they did not capture enough database. Millions of millions of Nigerians have been captured on those databases. You know, these three alone, if you, together with INEC, if you mix them, honestly speaking, you don't have any headache. You have enough database of Nigerians to work with. And you, all you need is interconnectivity and interoperability within this data to be able to, to you know, to confirm who is who. And, uh, and the process of registration should be continuous. Once a child turns 18, as it happens in, in Britain, you know, uh, they're automatically reminded that, you know, they should come and register uh, and collect their voter card. You don't have to wait until election time. It is the right of all citizens. So I would have preferred to see that kind of comprehensive policy approach that captures interoperational inter uh, uh, databases uh, to have comprehensive data of all adult Nigerians and those, uh, and then their voters, and to make voting something that is not an ordeal, that's not difficult. I can tell you, it's a long story. I decided to be a participant observer of the registration, you know, registration. In 2019, uh, you know, 2018, sorry, by September, you know, when, during, when they announced that INEC will now be closing the registration process, I went to some suburbs of Abuja just to watch. And I, what I saw was very shocking. There are there women, expectant mothers with babies on their back, waiting from early morning to 4, 5 p.m. They were not able to register. I never could bring just two or three uh, registration machines. After a while, they saw all the others have packed up. There's a problem with them. There's only one. They'll keep people there in the rain, in the sun, nowhere to sit. And they deliberately make sure there are no seats there. You can only sit on the floor, in the grass. And in fact, lo and behold, some of the INEC agents were going about collecting 3,000, 5,000 to register people, poor people, the poor mother. Maybe she doesn't make up to 2,000 a day. You are collecting 5,000 for, and some of them did it out of principle because they want to exercise their right to vote. And yet, we were told that in some parts of the country, they were literally carrying the machines into people's homes and getting them registered. They were registering even kids and goats and their cows. It's been documented. So Nigeria, we have very serious problems. There's a crisis of legitimacy. And uh, some people want democracy, but they want democracy only on their own terms. They don't want democracy for the whole of the country. And this is very sad, very unfortunate. But you see, that is the easiest way to destroy democracy. Why is it so difficult for governments, governments, um, talking about um, governments of um, Dolusha Goba Sonjo, governments of um, Musa Yaradua, governments of of good luck, Jonathan, and this present government. Why is this, does it seem so difficult for them to find a solution to uh, our borders? Uh, the last time the borders were shut down, even the, the customs did come to say that um, there were over a uh, hundred illegal, illegal routes into this country. Why are we having this huge challenge in dealing with our border, our, our, our border concerns? The northern borders were never closed. Never, never closed. It was a hypocrisy. They closed down the, the Cotonou border. They closed down the Cameroon border. But they never closed down the northern borders. They never did. This 
continue to infiltrate as they've always done. Tackling this issue, let us take a decision to close down the northern borders. And anybody who find from a neighboring country coming here to kill and rape and maim, we should catch them, we should take them back to those countries and demand heavy compensation as required under international law. Because if you knowingly allow your own people to infiltrate another country, bearing military-grade weapons, it is a declaration of war as far as I'm concerned and as far as international law uh, is concerned. So we didn't really close down those borders. It was a pretense. Now we need to do it genuinely in order to tackle what I consider to be one of the greatest, <coughs> excuse me, one of the greatest evils of our time. That, that is my honest opinion. Lafia will be greatly missed, greatly, greatly missed. I, like we did say earlier, I enjoyed every minute, every second, every opportunity I had to interview him it was indeed a, a huge pleasure and it's so painful that that would never happen ever, ever again. Mm. It would never happen ever again. Never, ever again. And um, as we think about, um, you know, I know it's easy for us to think about what the great contribution he had to the nation, uh, to the politics, to the economy, but his family, most especially at this time, I cannot imagine what they're going through and have to deal with, um, you know, so much more. But I think, and I believe they can rest in this, that um, every single minute of his adult life, you know, he, 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 he gave everything, you know, that's basically what he did. Every time we called on him to talk about issues to the point where he said, even if my life was taken, I will be satisfied that I've spoken in truth mm -hmm. about all that I know mm -hmm. and dealt with in such a humble spirit. Uh, we really are going to miss Dr. Uh, Milafia Obadiah. And uh, once again, uh, great nation and good people. Good people. We're going on a quick break. Uh, we come back, uh, we look at Nigeria's debt problem. Uh, what is there for us to fear? Uh, what is there for us to confront? Please stay with us on News Hub.